Coming up on Triangulation, Meredith Broussard is here. She's going to talk about her new book, Artificial Unintelligence, about how computers misunderstand the world. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation. Episode 383, recorded December 10th, 2018, for February 1st, 2019. Meredith Broussard, Artificial Unintelligence. Welcome to Triangulation. This is the show that every week we speak to some of the most enlightening, fascinating people working in tech and writing about tech. And today my guest does both and has an interesting story about why she's doing, does more writing uh, than tech or more tech tech writing. We'll, we'll get her, we'll have her explain it. Uh, Meredith Broussard uh, is a professor at NYU, a data journalist, a programmer and author of the book, Artificial Unintelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World, basically about how AI does not do as much as you think. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, so I love this book. Um, I love the premise because I think it's uh, I think it's so much of what we grew up with. I, I, you, you say the years you were in college, so I think we're about the same age. Uh, and um, so we, I think we had the same similar experience of uh, the early 90s being in college and just um, thinking that technology was going to solve all our problems. Um, and, you know, it being sort of, uh, the, while we were in college, sort of the birth of the internet kind of, you know, not as we know it, but um, of course it was there, you know, back in the 70s, but it was a different kind of internet. Um, so t let's talk a little bit about your background. You, you start with the book, um, with your childhood, uh, your experience with a robot. So tell, tell that story. So when I was about seven, my parents bought me for Christmas an erector set, uh, which was this, uh, this fantastic kit where you got like little... Uh, little pieces of pierced metal and little tiny child-sized wrenches and screws, and you could put together a, uh, a robot. And so I was so excited about this robot, and I thought this robot was going to be my new best friend, and I thought this robot was going to sing and dance and play with me. And then the reality of the robot was totally different. I assembled this whole thing. I spent, you know, days, weeks assembling this thing. And there was a little tiny battery pack with a little tiny motor. And so I plug it in and I connect the wires, and I plug in the battery and nothing happens. And I was just, I was so disappointed in that moment. And I tried all the things I could think of. Like I swapped the batteries and I turned it off and then on again. And I went and got my mother and I said, Mom, it's not working. And she said, well, did you try turning it on and turning it <laughs> off again? And try switching the batteries. I said, yes. So she looked at it and she said, oh, it's broken. And I was very sad. But then she explained that uh, things break and that uh, there are problems in assembly lines. And sometimes parts just don't work as you expect them to. And so then we went and we got, you know, we got a replacement motor and we plugged it in and it did eventually work, but it was very anticlimactic at that point. And so that's the lesson that I've taken uh, with me into every uh, bit of technology that I build. Because I started, uh, I started coding shortly after that. I think I wrote my first, uh, my first program when I was about 11. And uh, so I've been writing computer programs for my entire life, basically. And I do it with the awareness that things break, that uh, pieces don't always work the way that you expect, and that technology is not infallible. And so I think in this new world where we're talking a lot about AI and we're talking about all the things that AI can do, it's really great, but we need to temper it with the awareness that things break and things don't always work the way that you expect. I think that's it's such a great story because I think so many people that I know, um, you know, my parents, uh, some of my friends, I mean, many of my women friends, it's when something doesn't work, it's, they think it's their fault. Well, well, I just don't know how to use it. Like I, you know, I'm not good at technology or, you know, and it's like, well, no, maybe it's not, it, maybe it's broken or maybe, you know, it needs to be better at understanding how you use it. Um, it's so true to, 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 to take the lesson that you learned from that 
um, is so important. Um, so you said you write that by your junior year, you could make a web page, you could uh, spin up a spin up a web server, write code in six different programming language languages. And for an undergraduate majoring in math, computer science or engineering, at the time, this was completely normal. For a woman, it wasn't. You were one of six undergraduates, six undergraduate women majoring in computer science at a university of 20,000 graduates and, and undergraduate students. Um, and you only knew two of the other women in computer science. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is something we hear about a lot. I, I'd, I'd love to talk, uh, I'd love for you to talk about, like, what, what was that like? What was that college experience like for you? Uh, it was really lonely. It was lonely and it was alienating. Uh, and I could, I could see what the issues were. I could see uh, the pipeline issues happening uh, in real time to me. Uh, but I wasn't empowered to make any changes. Uh, and I, since the book came out, I've actually since been introduced to uh, one of the other women computer science majors who I could not find at the time. Uh, and she's doing great. Like she's, she's very successful in her career. Uh, and I... Uh, I, I salute her for, and I salute all of the uh, all of the women majoring in computer science at that time, for being able to make it through. Because the sexism is real, the isolation and the alienation is real, and I think what people don't realize is that the social forces that tell girls that they're not good at science or they're not good at math. Those are not just forces that uh, that happen in high school. Those forces start in third grade. As early as third grade, little girls are getting messages that they're not good at science or math or that boys are better at science and math. And so we really, if we're going to uh, reverse the, or if we're going to have equal representation in STEM fields, we can't just intervene in college and we can't just intervene in high school. We have to intervene all the way along educationally. And, and you talk about this in your book, uh, you know, inevitably when, when I uh, talk about, you know, few people being in the computer science, few women being in computer sciences, I inev inevitably get people who say, well, you know, there were only two people in my CS class. There were only, you know, four people in my whole program. And and uh, the, the conclusion that people draw is that women aren't drawn to this. They, they don't like it. It's not, they're not fit for it. They're, you know, whatever it is, um, whatever way someone can put their foot in their mouth about this. But you say that, I mean, like you're talking about, it needs to start, it starts early um, and it's in the language and just all of this is, is built in. Uh, talk a little bit about um, about how it's just baked in, not just uh, starting early, but in, you know, in computer science languages and in, uh, in school, how, how is it part of, how is that sexism part of, uh, of the education? Well, it, uh, God, it's so, I, uh, it's so omnipresent. Uh, if you think about uh, think about the stereotypical image of a computer scientist, right? Like, do you picture a woman or do you picture a man? Mm. Yeah. And I mean, it's obvious. Like, our stereotype of a computer scientist is a man. He's probably in a hoodie. He's probably a white man. He's probably uh, young, right? Now, most computer scientists actually don't look like that, but uh, that's our stereotype. Uh, when you think about a stereotype of a mathematician, uh, who pops into your brain? Well, it's probably a man. It's probably a nerdy man with a pocket protector, maybe if we're, uh, if we're going with, uh, with kind of Hollywood stereotypes. Um, and one of the things that's important to realize is that computer science is a descendant of mathematics. And so, Math has as much of a gender, has a worse gender problem than a lot of other fields. And so computer science has inherited all of the biases and uh, all of the problems of mathematics. Because until the 1940s, we didn't have computer scientists. All the early computer scientists were mathematicians. And, and you say that really, if you want to be a programmer, you don't really need any math higher than sixth or eighth grade math. Right, you can do, uh, you can do, you can have a very good career as a, as a programmer nowadays without knowing higher math. So it used to be that computer science, uh, 
required you to do a lot of higher level math, uh, and it doesn't anymore. Uh, that's one of the uh, that's one of the consequences of automation. And computers literally compute, so they're they're machines for doing math, and so they've uh, they've gotten very good. Or programmers have made excellent programs for uh, camouflaging math, so we can do programming in. Uh, kind of more human-like language nowadays. So you get to be distanced from the mathematics a lot. So if uh, what I would say to anybody who is uh, who is watching and is feeling uh, feeling like maybe they don't have the mathematical chops to go into computer science or to get a job as a programmer, I would say that as long as you could handle math up until about eighth grade, you ought to be fine. That's good advice. I think it, so much of it has to do with how uh, people explain things. Um, and that's one of the things that struck me with your book. I mean, I, I gather that it's sort of your, uh, you, I can, as I was reading it, I can imagine you standing in front of a group of undergraduates. And I appreciated that because it wasn't, you weren't dumbing it down at all, um, but you were clearly explaining things. I mean, for example, you go through uh, the way to, you know, the hello world, which is the first thing that everybody learns, of course, and you, you know, have the reader write it down with a pen and paper and then, you know, say it out loud, write it down as a pen and, pen and paper, then open up the terminal on your Mac and then show how you do it. Um, was, just, how did you choose the audience for this book? Because, I mean, I've read so many, I've, you know, read so many books about this that just are either over my head or under my head. And this was just right there where I needed it to be. Um, how did you choose what audience you're going to aim this at? Oh, well, I'm so glad to hear that because that's uh, that's exactly what I was trying to do uh, with the level of the book. Uh, I have also had the experience that uh, a lot of technical writing is either like way up here or way down here and it's kind of not where I need it to be. So I really uh, picked a level for the book that uh, is similar to the level that I use in my classes. Uh, so I have very, very bright students in my classes, but uh, nobody knows everything. And uh, it's it's very important for uh, kind of to be an empowered digital citizen. It's very important to uh, know the foundational concepts inside technology. And what I discovered in the classroom was that uh, K through 12 computer science education nowadays often doesn't include the kinds of things that I learned in my K through 12 computer science education. So like students are not really learning basic programming anymore. Uh, and I found that a lot of students felt really intimidated by something like using the terminal, right? So I, one of the things that I do in my classes is we do a hands-on exercise where we go into the terminal and we write some Python code and nobody dies. And <laughs> like, it's a really important, uh, it's a really important lesson that you can do this. Uh, so in the book, I take readers through uh, what is it like to do this. And of course the terminal is much less user-friendly looking than anything else that you use on your computer. So if you're really comfortable in your web browser, maybe you open up the terminal window and it's black and you have to type everything instead of using the mouse and people, people sometimes feel intimidated by that. And you don't really have to, but I, uh, some people do. And so I want people to get over that feeling of anxiety. I want people to feel empowered uh, so that they also feel empowered to, uh, to say no to computational decisions when those decisions are illogical or unfair. Mm, yeah, that's so important. I, I think um, my experience sometimes with the terminal is like having people say like, oh, don't mess with the terminal. You're going to mess something up. You know, you don't like worry your pretty little head about the terminal. Like, we'll take care of that. Oh, yeah. And that <laughs> just uh, really Trust that it, it, it just becomes now that everything is technology, our, you know, our door locks and our cars and everything. I mean, you just can't treat it that way. It's, you know, you're doomed if you do. Um, right. So yeah, it was really nice to have you say like, just open it up. It's fine. I <laughs> like I already trusted you by page twelve or whatever it was where you got that. So, oh, um, so good. Well, you know, one of the things I tell my students is the only way you can break your computer is with a hammer. <laughs> yes. 
Which, by the way, I do also recommend taking an old computer apart and using a hammer on it and just like opening that thing up and looking at where the wires go in and where the wires go out and how everything is put together. Yeah, there's some uh, great pictures in the book of, you know, what the inside of a computer looks like. And you, you do take to the hammer, which uh, take the hammer to the hard drive, which you say is the only real way to protect your privacy, <laughs> which mm -hmm. uh, is true. And I mean, I think that that's so important, too, because uh, I'm on this big kick of like just fixing our stuff instead of upgrading it to something else and just mm -hmm. hoping the best for uh, for what, you know, our old iPhones. And I just think that's that's so yeah. important. And if you're scared of that, you're just going to keep upgrading. And then we have this giant pile of e-waste that we don't know what to do with so exactly exactly <laughs> you know, I'm very uh, I'm very interested in the right to repair movement mm -hmm. uh, I've been uh, kind of following along as uh, as uh, people like farmers uh, advocate for the right to repair their uh, their tractors because mm -hmm. tractors are increasingly computerized nowadays it's very it's a very interesting movement. Yeah, and it, I mean, it really does uh, dovetail nicely with you, the work that you're doing. And as we were talking before the show started about uh, your key fob battery <laughs> uh, being, uh, you know, burning out. And so you you couldn't, you had to figure out how to unlock your door. Um, and I think that that is... With with the right to repair mo movement, it's interesting because cars, like there's laws around, you know, the repair shops of cars uh, that they can, you know, they can know what the, they're allowed to know what those mysterious car uh, error codes are. But now with iPhones, we're not allowed to know what they mean. You know, it's very close, closed in system. So, yeah. So let's talk about artificial intelligence, which is the the meat of this of your book. Um, and and by the way, we say you know if if you think oh well I know how to write Hello World in twenty six different programming languages, then you do a good job of saying like we'll skip to chapter four and you know you'll be fine. So you can do that too. Um, so AI, uh, there's two different kinds of AI: the, the uh, narrow AI and the other one. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between those two? Sure. So. General AI is the uh, is the Hollywood image of AI. So that's the Terminator. That's the singularity. That's the robots that are going to take over the world. That's like anything that's about uh, making a little uh, brain inside the computer, making the computer sentient somehow. Uh, that's androids, and that's all imaginary. Narrow AI is actually what we have. Narrow AI is real. And narrow AI is just math. It's very, very beautiful math. It's gorgeous and complicated uh, and high level math, but it's just math. Uh, it's basically a computational statistics on steroids. And so it's really important to keep in mind the distinction between narrow and general AI, because when you start imagining, oh, well, the Hollywood image of AI you know, is, is real, then we kind of get confused, right? So you need to be you need to make sure in conversations about AI that you and the person you're talking to are actually talking about the same thing. Because if you're talking about uh, making the Terminator and I'm talking about uh, predicting uh, someone's uh, predicting whether or not somebody is going to repay their mortgage and you know making a decision on a loan, those are two totally different things. And we need to make sure that we are talking about the same thing so that we can be on common ground, especially when we're talking about how to make policy. And people also uh, now use the term machine learning and AI interchangeably, and you say that's wrong as well. Oh, yeah. So this is one of the things that I find super interesting. So as, as a writer, I'm really interested in language. And so uh, but then as a computer scientist, I'm also very interested in precision. I guess as a writer, I'm interested in precision around language as well. Uh, but so artificial intelligence is a subfield of computer science, the same way that algebra is a subfield of mathematics. And inside the field of artificial intelligence, uh, there are other subfields. Okay, so machine learning is one subfield of artificial intelligence. Uh, natural language processing is another subfield. Expert systems is another field. Uh, but machine learning is the one that's most popular right now. And so most of the time when people say, 
oh, I'm using AI for business, what they actually mean is that they're using machine learning for business. And so the two terms have become confused. But the other really interesting thing here is the implications of the term artificial intelligence. It makes it sound like there's a little brain inside the computer. Same thing with machine learning. Even though I absolutely know with all of my brain and all of my heart that there is nothing sentient inside this machine, when I hear machine learning, I still think, oh, the machine is maybe learning the way that a human being does, and that is not true. So there's a lot of power in language, and we have to make sure that uh, we respect the fact that uh, language creep happens uh, and that we still recognize that we're talking about math when we're talking about machine learning. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to, like, when you, you know, when you hear that a computer has beaten a chess master or a Go master, it's hard to not sort of imagine, like, that they went through the same things that the, the, the chess or Go master did, just trying really hard until they got it right <laughs> and working really hard. And that's that's not true. You, you go into detail kind of about how that works and, and why they, why people use games uh, as a uh, barometer of how well AI is doing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. The people who make uh, who make computer programs and who make uh, machine learning algorithms and who do artificial intelligence, uh, there's been kind of a, a social thing that's happened inside those fields where uh, most of the people who are in the field really, really like playing games. And they really, really like playing games like chess. And so it came to be that that small and homogeneous group of people decided that, oh, smart people play chess. And therefore, if we're going to make a computer that's smart, the computer is going to play chess. And if it wins at chess, then it must be the smartest and it must be artificially intelligent, which is not true. But... Uh, it explains why uh, there's been so much effort at getting computers to play chess. I mean, first it was uh, first it was tic tac toe uh, that computers mastered, and then it was checkers, and then it was chess, and then it was go. And each one of these games is incrementally harder, and it takes decades to figure out how to get a computer to uh, to win at these games, at these zero sum games. Uh, and it's a pretty remarkable achievement, but. One of the things that I find so interesting about it is that it's about human achievement. So uh, in the book, I go through uh, what it took to get the computer to beat the human expert at Go. And what happened was people play computer Go all the time. Like there are thousands and thousands and thousands of games of computer Go happening at any given moment. and. People have been training for Go tournaments by playing Computer Go for years and years. And all of that data gets captured and it gets represented in data sets, right? So we have millions of hours of recorded data on uh, people who are bad and people who are good uh, playing Go all over the world. And so we have all of these permutations. So what the uh, computer scientists did was they took all of that data and they plunked it into the computer. Uh, and they said, computer, uh, pick your strategy based on the strategies that have been successful in this data set. And there's actually so much data now that yes, it is possible to beat the best human Go player. But it's not about the computer using its own strategy that it came up with. It's about the computer using strategies that were created by the best Go players in the world. Mm. So, so is which there... Is a really, go ahead. Oh, well, so which I think is a really uh, interesting phenomenon because we imagine that the computer is autonomously doing something, right? Like we imagine that the computer has been programmed to make these, uh, these decisions on its own. But actually, no, it's a totally different paradigm. And uh, it relies on something that 
uh, is called the unreasonable effectiveness of data. So if you have enough data, you can get a computer to make pretty uh, reasonably accurate guesses about what is going to happen next in very, very highly constrained situations. And the people who are writing these algorithms don't really understand what's going on in the black box and they can't really express what's going on in the black box. They just know that it works. Right, so the unreasonable effectiveness of data describes this phenomenon. So, this is uh, this is probably where we might start talking about uh, techno chauvinism, which uh, is a, one of the major terms that you use in the book. Um, chauvinism, obviously, just um, <laughs> is uh, is a gendered term, and it seems to me sort of like a little bit of an old fashioned term. I, th I thought about the word for a long time because I don't think I've never really heard it used in any way besides male chauvinism. But um, but techno, talk a little bit about what techno chauvinism is and why you chose that word. So techno chauvinism is the idea that technology is always the highest and best solution. Techno chauvinists believe that uh, computer solutions are better than human solutions. Uh, in the same way that uh, chauvinists uh, believe that men are better than women at certain things, right? So uh, it's a kind of bias. And techno chauvinism, of course, has a gender component to it. Uh, there's a kind of hefty dose of unacknowledged sexism inside techno chauvinism. Uh, so I, I have noticed something happening in the past couple of decades where people have started saying things like, uh, making a decision using a computer is better than making a decision uh, through social means because the computer is more unbiased, the computer is more objective. And we believe that for a long, long time, but it's become apparent in the past couple of years that that belief was wrong, that the bias toward uh, using computers over using humans is itself a kind of bias and is, uh, is dangerous in and of itself. So we have situations like um, the compass algorithm, which you're probably, uh, you're probably familiar with. Um, and that was an algorithm that was used to decide uh, on sentencing and on whether or not somebody would receive bail after they were arrested. And it was a very, very uh, straightforward, uh, straightforward equation that would uh, take the results of a quiz. Uh, so you'd be given this, this quiz after you were arrested and uh, crunch the numbers on your quiz and give a, uh, a number that was a recommendation on whether or not you were uh, at risk of reoffending. And well, it turns out that the algorithm was biased against black people. And mathematically, there was no way for the algorithm to treat black and white people fairly or equally in this situation. So it turns out that uh, even though we imagined at first that we were going to uh, kind of go into the new technological utopia where uh, computers were going to make all of our decisions and it was going to bring about this better world, it actually turns out that uh, the computational world simply reproduces the inequalities of the existing world. And so we live in a world where there is uh, structural racism. Well, that gets reproduced inside computational systems. We live in a world where there is profound sexism at every level of society. And that gets reproduced in computational systems. So what I would argue for is I would argue instead of techno chauvinism, instead of just assuming that computers do everything better than humans, I would argue that we need to think about what is the right tool for the task. And sometimes that tool is a computer and sometimes that tool is a human and one is not better than the other. It's situational. Uh, and we have the capacity to build these systems that uh, use computers to make decisions and also use humans 
to make decisions, right? Like it's not, it's not an either or proposition. So the to, the tool, um, using the right tool, you you go into that uh, that that metaphor that that story is about uh, an experiment you did with the Philadelphia school or an experience you had with this, the Philadelphia school system, um, where you had a conversation with someone that said you know who said well books are always better than uh, or that. Um, I think, why don't you tell the story about the, uh, I think the conversation started with uh, saying that why, you know, if there aren't enough books, why not just put the books on an iPad or a computer? Um, and that, that is always better. Talk a little bit about your experience about the t what the right tool with is for the job in that experience. Sure. Um, well, so this investigated investigation started uh, because I was having an argument with my kid. So my kid was in first grade. And he came home with this worksheet and I said, mom, I need help with my, uh, with my homework. And I said, sure, of course, uh, because you know, I love helping with this homework. And he said, I need to write down natural resources. And I said, oil, gas, coal. And he said, no, those are not natural resources. I said, well, of course they are. Uh, and he said, no, well, that's not what the teacher said in class. And I realized that this was a moment that was about, uh, what was the right answer that would get him full credit on the assignment, not what was the right answer in the cosmic sense? Because of course I was right, <laughs> but he was also right. Uh, and so I needed to teach him how to do school, not you know, about oil, gas, and coal. So I said, well, let's look in the book. We'll get the right answer by looking in the book. And he said, well, there's no book. I said, well, there's, of course there's a book. There's always a book. That's how school works. I said, well, there is a book, but we're not allowed to bring it home. Uh, the teacher would not let them take home the books that they needed to do their homework. And I thought, okay, well, there's got to be an electronic version of this textbook, right? So I spend like two and a half hours trying to hack into the electronic textbook site because the teacher has forgotten to give us all the password for the electronic textbook site. So it was just <laughs> like a big mess. And uh, eventually I do help with homework and it's all totally fine. Uh, but I started getting worried because this was in first grade and I figured if I'm a college professor and I'm having trouble helping my kid with his first grade homework, like by the time he gets to third grade and he has to do the standardized tests, I'm really worried. I'm really worried about how is he going to find out the right answer for the standardized tests if he's not allowed to have the books. And so I started looking at test scores overall in Philadelphia, which is where I was living then. And I asked, well, if Philadelphia public schools have never been able to get more than 50% of their students to pass the standardized tests, is the lack of books part of the problem? Are the students actually getting access to the materials that they need in order to learn the material that's on the state mandated standardized tests? And it turns out that this was a really hard question to answer because there are hundreds of schools, there are thousands upon thousands of students in the schools. Uh, the school district is profoundly under-resourced and in under-resourced school districts, you actually don't have people, you don't have enough people in the schools to keep track of what is physically in the schools. So inventory issues are a really big problem. Uh, so I could have stopped there. Uh, perhaps I should have, but I, I got really interested in this. And I realized that the only way to answer this question of do Philadelphia students have enough books was to build artificial intelligence software. And so I did. And I, I discovered that indeed schools do not have enough books. And furthermore, the schools did not have enough money in their budget to buy the books that they would need to prepare the students in order to pass the state mandated standardized tests. So it was a big complicated problem, but then there's a digital element to it as well, because we talk a lot about the digital divide, right? Like the, uh, the uh, conversation about uh, technology in schools used to be about digital divide and who is kind of on which side of the digital divide. Uh, 
But then the conversation moved to, uh, well, maybe we should just uh, give everybody laptops or iPads and get rid of the physical books. Well, it turns out that people process information differently on screens and on paper. And if you're reading for entertainment, uh, which many of us do, reading electronically is just fine. But if you're reading for comprehension, if you're reading for deep knowledge, print is actually a better interface. And print is actually also a better interface for uh, sitting around in a room and talking about books or talking about ideas. And print is especially a really good interface for a bunch of small children or tweens or teens sitting around and talking about ideas because a print book is not as exciting as a uh, as a digital uh, a digital device. You know, I I rarely get distracted by uh, the pages in my novel, my printed novel, uh, whereas I get distracted all the time by the blips and beeps of my computer. So, in education, as in so many other things, it's really about using the right tool for the task. And sometimes the right tool is a print book, is a codex. It's cheap, uh, it's easy to replace, uh, you can make notes in it, uh, it doesn't run out of power, and it also doesn't take any infrastructure. One of the things that people forget about uh, technology in schools is that it requires a massive amount of effort to keep it going. So it's not just about, oh, let's buy the kids iPads and put all their books on them. You need to have power in the schools. Uh, so lots of classrooms don't actually have enough power outlets uh, or enough um, enough juice to support 30 odd iPads plugged in all at the same time, okay? You need to have wireless and you need to have somebody to maintain it. Um, if you've ever been at a, uh, at a tech conference in a hotel, the wireless quickly gets overwhelmed by the uh, by the demands of a bunch of you know hundreds of technologists trying to use it at the same time, and same thing happens in schools when I uh, you know you have what like three devices per person you're trying to get them all onto a wireless network at the same time like the wireless network gets overwhelmed, uh, so you need power you need wireless you also need HVAC. You need air conditioning because computers overheat very easily. And so if you don't have air conditioning in your schools, then you can't run computers. Well, lots and lots of urban public schools don't have air conditioning. And in Philadelphia specifically, the schools close often in the summertime because of excessive heat. And they don't have the money to put in air conditioning and they don't have the necessary power to put in air conditioning. So I thought it was just, I thought the story was just about books, but it was about so much more. And it's all wrapped up together. And so when we're thinking about technology issues, we're really thinking about big social issues. And we need to consider a lot of things all at once. So the, you, you called it the Institutional Materials Refresh Program. Um, which meant maybe some computers and maybe some books. How, how did uh, how is, how did that go? Is it uh, is the project done? Uh, they did allocate uh, several million dollars to uh, instructional materials refresh. So I was thrilled to see that. Uh, I do not think that the problem is fixed entirely, however. I was hoping you would say it was the whole public school education <laughs> system was fixed, but not yet, I guess. Yeah. Well, I tried. <laughs> uh, so I don't. We didn't talk about uh, what you do now. That you're a data journalist. I kind of skipped past that. Um, now you were you were a computer science major at Harvard, um, and then how did you be? Was data data journalism a subject at that point? Uh, no, it wasn't. It, I really uh, I wish that it were. So data journalism uh, is a term that uh, dates to about uh, 2006. Um, and uh, it is the current incarnation of what we used to call computer assisted reporting. That was a term that uh, came about in the 80s when reporters all got computers on their desktops uh, for the first time. 
uh, and people started doing reporting with spreadsheets and with databases. And then before that, it was called precision reporting, which actually dates to 1968, which is the first time that the uh, tools of social science were used uh, in investigative reporting. Um, so Phil Meyer, a pioneer in the field, uh, used a mainframe computer to uh, to crunch some survey data and do an investigative story about the uh, Detroit race riots. Uh, so there's a, a a pretty reasonably long history of using computers for investigative journalism purposes. And so data journalism is the most recent incarnation of that. So what I do uh, is I uh, write computer code in order to commit acts of investigative reporting. Uh, I do a kind of reporting that's called algorithmic accountability reporting. And so there are two ways to do it. Uh, one way is uh, like what ProPublica does or what uh, Julia Angwin does with her new newsroom, The Markup. Uh, and that is investigating algorithms, black box, black, black box algorithms that are used to make decisions on our behalf, right? So that's the compass algorithm or the algorithm that is used to decide if you are uh, worthy of getting a new credit card uh, or the algorithms that uh, decide who gets into which New York City public high school. Right? So that's investigating algorithms that are out there. Uh, I do the other side of that, which is I write my own algorithms in order to uh, investigate social issues. So, so it's a relatively new field uh, in the sense that uh, we are using advanced uh, computational methods uh, for investigative journalism nowadays. And so you mentioned Julia Angwin, um, who used to be at ProPublica and now started her own thing. Is, so is that what she used to uncover? Um, I know she was the one that I think uncovered the the ads that um, were were racist um, in Facebook and other things like that. Is that does that is that data journalism? Yes, yes, that is data journalism, and that is algorithmic accountability reporting. Um, and uh, that's a particular strain of it. Sorry, we're getting really wonky here right now. <laughs> I'm putting on my journalism professor hat. Uh, so uh, there are lots of people who are investigating uh, platforms. So tech platforms have all of the same problems that uh, everything else in the real world has, and they need to be held accountable in the same way. So uh, people are starting to do investigative reporting projects on the different tech platforms uh, in order to find out uh, what are the, uh, you know, how are these pr platforms discriminating against citizens? Uh, what are the, uh, what are the threats to democracy posed by uh, things happening on these platforms? Uh, what is illegal activity that's happening on these platforms? Uh, so that's a very important function that journalism serves in a democracy is finding these things out. So uh, citizens can be more aware and can be empowered. Uh, and so, Journalists now are looking at tech like we look at anything else in the world and we're saying, okay, let's be realistic about the problems that we find. So, so one of those, the things, that, I mean, I completely understand techno chauvinism and once reading this book, I see it everywhere all the time and it's great to have a name for it. The, the one uh, chapter in here that really surprised me is about self-driving cars. Cause I'm someone that has been saying like, they cannot come soon enough. Hopefully before my kids get their driver's license, that hasn't happened. I have a daughter with a permit. And so apparently uh, it's, wow. not, it's not gonna happen soon enough for me. Um, and I always think, well, you know, yes, computers are better than humans. They're not gonna text, they're gonna be safer, but you sort of blew my mind on that too. Um, before I let you go, talk a little bit about um, what we're missing by saying that uh, self-driving cars are right around the corner and it can't come soon enough. Well, people have been saying self-driving cars are coming soon for decades, actually, which really surprised me. I thought that uh, self-driving cars dated to uh, the uh, the DARPA Grand Challenge, you know, only about a decade ago. Um, but it turns out that no, people have been working on this for a very, very long time. Uh, they've also been working on flying cars for a really long time, and that has also not happened. 
you know, much to many people's chagrin. Uh, I am unfortunately not one of those people who is like, super excited about flying cars, but I respect that other people are. Um, so self-driving cars uh, are uh, are like any other uh, any other technology. Um, and I got interested in them uh, a few years ago when I was uh, I was writing a story uh, for the University of Pennsylvania Alumni Magazine about the Penn driving team, Penn self-driving car team. And so I went for a ride in their uh, in their self-driving car, which they were preparing for the DARPA Grand Challenge. And I thought I was going to die <laughs> or vomit or both simultaneously. It was the most terrifying experience. And so I realized like, oh, I don't really trust these people to make a self-driving car that's not going to kill people. Um, and so I kind of forgot about it for years. But then I realized that oh, there's all this rhetoric about self-driving cars coming to market soon. And it's these same dudes who almost killed me in the parking lot. So, I mean, I because of this experience, I have different perspective than most people, right? Like most people have not been in a self-driving car. Most people have only seen uh, videos of them or they've like been on test drives in very, very highly controlled situations. Um, so when you look at the... Uh, the code that is being used in self-driving cars, when you look at the people who are making the code that goes into self-driving cars, when you look at the data uh, that's being used to train self-driving cars, it is not as robust as you imagine, okay? So the, uh, for example, the image recognition algorithms that are used, uh, you know, that the cars use in order to recognize objects in the real world and respond to them are very, very easily defeated, right? So like the, uh, the car needs to uh, use its sensors to take in data and, uh, and take in the picture of the stop sign at the corner and then trigger a subroutine that makes the, uh, makes the car slow down and stop at the line before the stop sign, right? So if I were to go around and put a sparkly unicorn sticker onto a stop sign, the car would stop recognizing the stop sign as, as a stop sign. Like it would not trigger the subroutine and then the car would drive through the intersection and cause an accident, which is terrible because like I see stop signs in disrepair and I see street signs in disrepair all the time. I mean, I live in New York City, like stuff is not in great repair. Like the lines are all worn off of the roads. And so we need things like lines on the roads and we need pristine street signs if self-driving cars are going to work. But that's not the world that we live in. And it's definitely not a world that we're going to live in anytime soon if we still can't get books to kids in schools because we don't have enough electricity in the schools. So it's about systems. So. Self-driving cars do not work as well as you think. Uh, there are problems with the systems. And then there's also the problem of what happens when you take away the driver in a rideshare situation. Mm. Now, I actually do not, uh, I do not think that there are any women out there who want to get into a ride, an autonomous rideshare alone with some strange man in the middle of the night. So like, let's say you wanna take a rideshare home after you've been like out at the bars and you wanna take a, uh, you wanna take a rideshare back to Brooklyn because the rideshare is cheaper than taking it by yourself. Well, getting into a car with a strange man in the middle of the night is not something that sounds safe. Mm -hmm. So we still have the social problems of, you know, of, of people in the world. And right now, the reason that we can do ride shares and the reason that, you know, it's fine taking a ride share home late at night uh, is that there's a driver mm -hmm. and the driver is there to mediate any, uh, any problems. So when you take away the driver, you're taking away an essential part of the social contract. And that also does not seem safe. Yeah. 
it's the same when someone talks about an autonomous school bus too, which is like this driver oh my is God. not just Terrifies there me. <laughs> yeah, to drive the bus. Right. That's not his main job. Why on earth would you want like 50 children on like in a machine all by themselves? Like if we don't let kids cross the street by themselves, like why on earth are we thinking about putting them into a bus mm -hmm. by themselves? It's going to be like Lord of the Flies in there. <laughs> Uh, so the the way we got the hype around self driving cars or you know self uh, or you know ride share um, that has to do with so much that you've written about uh, Marvin Minsky and just how like the history of just not people th people not thinking about what did you think would happen uh, so I won't get that that's all stuff that you'll have to read in the book um, but before we go okay I understand that uh, techno chauvinism is bad but we don't want to be luddites and you're not a luddite so talk a little bit about the the middle range um, you call it like human in the loop systems uh, that's that's the positive uh, point of this let's let's end with that. Yeah, I, so there are two kinds of systems that uh, the people generally talk about. There are autonomous systems and human in the loop systems. So autonomous systems operate without any human intervention. Uh, and so that's like the Facebook fantasy of, oh, we'll write some AI tools that will just like monitor, uh, you know, what people are doing on the platform and we won't need to have uh, humans intervening at all. Or that's the fantasy of, oh, I'm going to use my app to call a car, a self-driving car, and I'll just get in it and it'll take me somewhere. And then it will uh, it will just like disappear, right? So that's the autonomous fantasy. Whereas what I would argue for is uh, a human in the loop system. And in a human in the loop system, a human is an integral part of the system. Uh, so that's what we have in current uh, current driving. So uh, maybe you have like a parking assist feature in your car. Like there are cars that, uh, that have parallel parking systems that, you know, it's very good as like a small and finite exercise in geometry. Uh, or there are cars that uh, will beep when you, uh, when you veer out of your lane. And that's also really, uh, you know, some people find that really helpful, right? So I would encourage people to think about designing systems for humans, designing systems uh, that account for human frailty, for human fallibility, that allow for governance, uh, and that are, uh, are systems that embrace humanity as opposed to systems that try and shove humanity out of the way and make the world more convenient for machines. Because humans are the point. Humans are the point. <laughs> Meredith Broussard, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Meredith Broussard is the author of Artificial Unintelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World. She's a data journalist, a NYU prof professor. Uh, just check out her book. It's, um, it's in hardcover now, coming out in paper book back paperback uh it's it's amazing it's about the stuff we talk about on this network all the time but um just really uh, well researched amazing and funny really funny i laughed out loud at a lot of a lot of parts especially i love when you p chose one of your partners in the startup bus because of his laptop stickers so um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much uh thank so you great so to much be here. thank you take care have a great day have a great day. Thank you. And thank you for watching uh, Triangulation. Every week we talk to the brightest, most interesting, fascinating people writing about tech, working in tech, solving the world's problems, but really solving them, which often means like it, these are very difficult problems to solve and let's just talk about them. So thank you for joining us. I'm Megan Maroney. You can download the show at twit.tv slash try. You can watch us live. We usually record Fridays uh, at 3 p.m., but you never know when you can catch us live on the streams. So you can always watch that twit.tv uh, slash live and join us in the chat room and we'll see you next week on triangulation. Mm -hmm.